So Dr. Awad will start us off with an introduction to loneliness, where she will discuss the rise of loneliness, the impacts of such, and the importance of human connection, as well as a mental health toolkit. And then, alhamdulillah, we are honored to be joined by Sheikh Ubaidullah Evans, who will discuss the protective factors from Islam, maintaining and strengthening relations with family. And again, blessed to have Sheikh Rami Ansur join us as well for our Maristan Ramadan campaign. We will also have Amal the poet join us when she will provide us with a piece of spoken word. And then we have Sheikh Maryam Amir, mashallah. She will be talking to us about protective factors as well and how important it is to maintain and strengthen the relationships we have with our friends. And then we will also have Sheikh Maryam discuss how to make friends as an adult. And then we will have Sheikh Rami, mashallah, join our stage again and discuss how to protect our community from loneliness and reach out to others. And alhamdulillah, at the very end, we are blessed to have a panel and it'll be more like a fireside chat on the topic for today, which is again, navigating loneliness. Um, and we'll have everybody join us. So inshallah. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Executive Director and Co-Founder of Maristan, Dr. Rania Awad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. So many thanks for all of you who are joining us today on this 23rd day of Ramadan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from all of us our Ramadan, our fasting and our prayer, our du'as and our charity. MashaAllah, today, inshallah, I'm going to talk to you about a, uh, a discussion on loneliness. And I'll speak directly to the mental health impacts because inshallah later in the program, we'll also talk about the Islamic and communal aspects of this as well. The reason we decided to really talk about loneliness is because it is something that all people feel at some point in their life, subhanAllah. Some may say that mental health isn't something that they deal with, but the reality, loneliness as a subset of things that people deal with as part of their mental health is something we all actually deal with. A definition of mental health from those of, of uh, loneliness from a mental health background is that it is a gap between the level of connectedness that we feel versus what we actually want. And it's very different actually from social isolation. Social isolation is a lot more about your contacts and how many you have. So you can have a lot of contacts, but not actually feel lonely, or the opposite can be true with, again. It's a subjective feeling of loneliness. Some people feel content to be alone and others actually really do need the companionship of others. There are three kinds of loneliness that we discuss in the mental health field. One is emotional loneliness. A person longs for a close confident, uh, confidant and intimate partner, you know, kind of a mutual trust or bond. And this may happen with friends or maybe a marital bond. There's a second form of loneliness, which is social. And that is when people long for quality friendships and support. In our deen, we would call this a good suhba, a suhba saliha. And thirdly, collective loneliness. And this means basically network. You can have people all around you. You can have family, you can have friends, but maybe you don't have a larger network of people that share your interests and your purpose, sense of purpose in life. Basically, safe spaces that you can exist within. So today, inshallah, we're going to talk a little bit about the rise of loneliness. In fact, Many people would think this is because of the pandemic, but it's not just because of the pandemic. It turns out that a Harvard report on loneliness that was published in 2018, right before the pandemic, showed that in America, we have reached an all-time high for loneliness, with nearly half of the people in that study reporting always feeling alone. And the paradox is, this is a period of time in our history where we are more connected than ever by social media, phones, Zoom, and so on, yet loneliness is on the rise. And so what happens then, if you can imagine, that's where we were before the pandemic. And you enter into the pandemic with social isolation and other aspects of the pandemic that then really becomes more like a pressure cooker, right? A pressure pot. So the question might come up, why do we feel lonely? And on the mental health side of the discussion, we would say, you know, it's very much influenced by our social norms versus our individual needs. And this is why there needs to be a balance shift. 
kind of between different cultures, understanding that collectivist cultures tend to not feel quite as lonely as individualistic cultures. And here in the West, in the US, this really is an individualistic culture by and large. And we also have to understand that loneliness has a very clear public health crisis to it. Like there's an element of concern here because the research is showing that it is on the same scale. Imagine this, loneliness is on the same scale as the opiate epidemic or obesity. In fact, some studies are showing that a person who smokes 15 cigarettes a day can have the same levels of heightened health risks as the one who is lonely. There is other research showing that there are more adults experiencing loneliness than have diabetes. So you see, subhanAllah, when we talk about the impacts of something like this, you can see why we chose this as a topic, especially now that we are just past that two-year mark of the COVID-19 pandemic. And as I really kind of sum up a little bit here and kind of thinking about, well, what is the benefit of really thinking about how to solve this issue of loneliness? One of it is our natural fitrah, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created our primordial instincts, which is to connect, to be amongst people. And we know that people who are connected to each other actually live longer and potentially happier and healthier lives. There's a lot of evidence to show that when there's social support that people have, they're able to actually maintain both physical health and mental health. And so I'll just very quickly give us a couple of tips, basically five steps, like a toolkit of how to help loneliness from a mental health perspective. And then I'm very excited to have Sheikh Abedullah join us to talk about how to do this from a Islamic perspective, inshallah. So here's tip number one. In the research about loneliness, of how to combat this and how to navigate it, one of the most interesting ones that stood out to me was getting out in nature. I love this, subhanAllah, because there's something about feeling grounded that's very helpful. Something about the greenery, and our spiritual teachers would say this too, touch a tree, a leaf, something that's real, because when you're in this virtual bubble all the time, it's hard to keep track of what's real and what isn't. And, uh, and because our organization is called Madistan, and it really is modeling itself after the traditional Islamic holistic healing centers of the past, they had greenery everywhere. And this was a very purposeful thing to really help us feel better. Number two, some people say, that they rather not have a big circle of friends or that they're an introvert or they have social anxiety, let's say. Number two is help another person in some way. This really does combat loneliness because even though you don't have to be directly connected to them or stuck to them, what happens is if you are doing something with a sense of purpose, of service to someone else, that feeling of loneliness starts to actually dissipate. And this comes even from research in medical uh, understanding and absolutely jives with our spiritual understanding Islamically as well. Number three, make time for the arts. Now, I know people might think this is an interesting one, but the Harvard Medical School has a project called the Unlonely Project. And what they found is when they had people who were feeling lonely work in arts, everything from poetry to pottery, and today we'll have a little poetry for you, inshallah, right? They felt that this space of the arts actually was purposeful, and it made them feel surprisingly connected, even if they were physically alone. So try that out, inshallah. Make space for that, just like making space for nature. Number four, reach out to people you know for no reason at all, <laughs> subhanAllah. And that means, you know, it's really easy to get caught up in this concept that we have to have a reason to call or text someone. But actually some researchers that looked at loneliness specifically said that if you reach out to people, even for no good reason at all, you start to feel that you're not as lonely anymore. An example of this is if you take a photo on your phone and you just send it off to anybody in your contact list, and just use it to get a conversation started, right? Look at this cool picture I took, right? It's a tool for connection. All of these modern devices we have, social media and phones, if we use them intentionally to share moments of our experiences authentically, then we start to feel a lot more connected. And lastly, tell people when you do feel lonely, 
you'll be surprised how many people actually do care. And they actually do respond out and say, give you some beautiful messages. And remember that you are never actually as alone as you feel. There are billions of people in this world, and so many of them have experienced loneliness as well. And it's a temporary thing that will pass. The sun will set, the sun will rise, you'll meet new people, you'll lose people, you'll meet more people. It's the kind of cycle of life. And so I'm reminded by the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, in which Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is worried about how the enemies are coming after them and they're hiding alone, isolated in this cave, worried for their lives. And he asks the Prophet or tells the Prophet if they were just to look down at their feet, they would see Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina, Sayyidina Muhammad and Sayyidina Abu Bakr hiding in the cave. And he reassures him and he says, what do you think of two people who the third of them is Allah? And then we have the verse in the Quran that reiterates this, where the where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet to tell Sayyidina Abu Bakr and remind him, Inna Allah ma'ana. Allah is with us always. And with this, inshallah, is a good segue, inshallah, to Shaykh Abaydullah, who's going to talk to us more about the Islamic response to loneliness. Please welcome scholar in residence and executive director of Alim, Sheikh Ubaidullah Evans. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna alhamda lillahi nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu wa nasta'hdiuhu wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina. Faman yahdihillahu falamudillalah wa man yudlil falahadiyalah. وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم It is a great honor and a great privilege to be albeit virtually <laughs> in your presence uh, this afternoon These are blessed last 10 nights of Ramadan and this is a blessed endeavor you know thinking about ways to serve our community and to contribute to healing especially those issues that don't get spoken about as much as maybe some other issues. Loneliness is one such issue. And when you think about kind of the supreme uh, remedy for loneliness, it is to recognize that God is with us. As Dr. Rania beautifully mentioned, uh, the story of the, the cave and the Prophet and Sayyidina Abu Bakr, but Allah says in the Quran, ma'akum aina ma kuntum, that God is with you wherever you are. This does not obviate our need for good company, but this is a reminder that the supreme companionship, the supreme ma'iyah that the Muslim is trying to deepen and to accentuate and to enhance is that, that witness with God. And that's why I was thinking in preparation for today that it is ironic or uh, perhaps poetic, you know, shout out to Amal the poet, that we're talking about loneliness at a time when some Muslims are engaging in self-imposed, not loneliness, but they're deepening that, that witness or that companionship or that connection with God, which we're always enjoying that. We're always experiencing that. So that's the first thing. And it's, you know, cleaning up those receptors so that we feel that, that, that witness, that ma'iyah. You know, the second thing is recognizing that in other than a few very specific instances, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, who is our exemplar, is our role model, is our lived example of what it means to be a centered, balanced, whole human being, he always preferred good company to loneliness or he always chose good company over solitude. Even if you know he was given to tahannuth or he was given to solitude, God made him choose good company. That the Prophet, peace be upon him, said famously, la ruhbaniyyata fil islam, that this Islamic religion, this faith of ours, is not a religion of monasticism. It is not a religion of self-imposed loneliness or a complete separation or divorce with the world. Rather, it is a relationship of deep affection. There are bonds of deep community. The Prophet, peace be upon him, was somebody deeply ensconced in the world around him. He was a neighbor. 
He was a relative. He was a husband. He was a parent. He was a leader. He was a confidant. He was a friend. So I think, you know, the first thing we, we look at is la ilaha illallah, that there's no God but Allah, and Allah is always with us. The second thing is that if we are following the example of the Prophet, peace be upon him, we should know that his lived example is one of excelling in your relationships with other people. It is not a spiritual cultivation that takes place outside of the context of relationships. And the third thing is that we need each other. There's a verse in the Quran where God speaks to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and he says, That it is God that helped you with his aid, it is God who granted you his support and the support of the believers. Don't forget the role that people play in your life. I don't care how singularly spiritual you regard yourself as or how uh, like a person that is you know, uh, apart from people and maybe some of us sacralize inappropriately, might I add, this ideal of being singular and, you know, we've seen all of these biopics about the hero's journey, and it's always a lonely journey. The prophet, peace be upon him, had ashab. He had companions. And they were together for life's highs, for life's lows, for life's travails, for life's triumphs. They, they cultivated a deep bond of togetherness. And it was that that they relied on in addition to relying on God. So that verse, very significant because from a theological perspective, one could say, if God helped the prophet with his help, why does God need to mention the believers? In fact, the believers, they are, they are you know, essentially a means of God helping the prophet, but it is to remind us of the significant role that we play in each other's lives. So those three things, I think are sufficient in the small amount of time I've been allotted that we remember that God is always with us. And that even now, as people are uh, doing i'tikaf, it is not a self-imposed loneliness. It is deepening. It is paying attention to that relationship with God so that we strengthen it. And it is what buoys us. It is what carries us, even when perhaps there is you know, separation from people that we also love. The second thing that I mentioned is the lived example of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that, you know, his is a very public spirituality. It is a very public religiosity. It is a really it is a religiosity that excels in human connection and human relationship. And then thirdly, that we need each other. Don't allow ourselves to be deceived into what I think is a very toxic culture of self-reliance. And no, we need each other. We need each other for support. We need each other for love. We need each other for validation. We need each other for comfort. We need each other for um, even just mutual enjoyment. Enjoyment is not full when it's solitary. So um, those are a few of the, the Islamic protections that come to mind when I think about loneliness. Please welcome poet Amal Kasir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That is also the title of my very first piece. Today, I ask the angels to visit you in this greeting. A divine appointment of God's salams here at Maristan's healing journey. Let's invite Allah's light into the brushing of our shoulders. Let us set our intentions right. Let's make the ummah's nur grow bolder. When I cast you a salam, wrap it in rahma and send it back. A peace be upon you, it is better than a shirt from off a back. A salam from a Muslim, that's a gift from the heaven. And you never know, it could have been sent down from the seventh. Assalamu alaikum. May God's peace be upon you. May the nur of a nur shine down on you. May the angels twirl around you. If you knew, it would astound you. 
what is packaged in our peace. This is a greeting that sets the spirits free. And I don't know about you, but the world outside does not necessarily scream peace. And yet the baraka of this greeting can turn our usra into ease. You would not believe me if I told you assalamu alaikum saved a life. You would not believe me if I told you it had the power to ease a Muslim strife. Sometimes it's a salam in the streets to remind you that you are not alone. And sometimes it's a salam to someone in need to remind you your mouth is a home. It is a sign of the end times when we pretend not to know one another like a family full of strangers, no sense of sister or brother. But this ummah is equipped with a vocabulary to carry each other's sorrows, to ensure God's blessings are all widespread, to ensure people spread peace tomorrow. So let's turn our mouths into gardens, orchards full of trees, from which we give to our ummah all this, and assalamu alaikum that you give me. <laughs> assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to the beautiful audience all over the United States, all over the world. My name is Amal and my name means hope in Arabic. I am so, so honored to be here with this beautiful organization who I believe with my heart that the impact of this work is going to last far beyond this moment today and perhaps far beyond our lifetimes as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it victorious and may our pockets just overflow to represent what it means to us. The poem that I have prepared for you all today is one that was born out of the COVID-19 pandemic at the end of what I would call my own personal year of sadness. And I think like many of us, the isolation that took place commanded us to sit inside with ourselves. And in the midst of that isolation, I ended up getting to know a whole different community. Um, and that was a community that was inside of me. One that I thought was just demons and darkness, but I ended up learning otherwise. Bismillah, here we go. <sighs> And now, please welcome the founder of the Qariya app, Sheikha Maryam Amir. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. When I moved to a different city, subhanallah, I didn't have any new friends. And I had left everyone that I had known since I was a young child. When I moved there, I got the news that my grandfather, may Allah have so much mercy on him, and all of our loved ones who passed away um, was very sick. And subhanAllah, he passed away. May Allah have so much mercy on him. I miss him and my loved ones so much. And I know many of you do miss the people that you have lost. And when we're going through that type of grief, sometimes we, we don't know how to reach out to someone and ask for emotional support. And I moved back to my city. I mean, I went back to the city that I had just moved to. And a friend of mine who I considered very close called a few weeks later. I hadn't heard from her when I had just lost uh, my loved one. And I was a little bit hurt that she hadn't called, even though we had known each other for many, many years. SubhanAllah, when she called me, she didn't say anything about my grandpa. And I didn't feel comfortable saying anything about him. May Allah have so much mercy on him and all our loved ones. And so I started to feel a little bit of resentment in addition to the hurt that I already felt. And she said to me, what's going on? I feel like we're strangers. And I, I shared with her, you didn't even say anything about, you know, my grandpa, rahimahullah. When he, when, when she heard this, she said to me, you're always so strong. You're just always so strong. I didn't think you needed any emotional support. And that's when I realized that this was a friend of mine who had seen me go through many difficulties throughout college. And I never complained. I never, complain is not the right word. I never shared that with her. I never talked to her about what I was going through. She would tell me what she was going through, but I just didn't tell her why. 
because I had kept hearing that the highest level of Iman is the person that doesn't complain. It's the person that doesn't talk to anyone else about their pain. It's the person that only goes to Allah to talk to him about what they are going through. And so because I had heard that so many times, I just didn't talk to my friends about anything that I was going through, thinking that's the highest level of Iman. And what they interpreted that to mean, including this friend, was I just didn't need to talk about anything I was going through. I realized that I actually wasn't being vulnerable with my friends because I thought the only place I should be vulnerable is with Allah. And that's true. There's a special type of vulnerability with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But also, Allah created us in communities for a reason. And this is what my friend told me. Allah didn't create us to be by ourselves all alone. He created us to be in communities so that we can support one another. Look at how the Prophet would talk to Abu Bakr when Abu Bakr saw the Prophet praying so hard, so intensely before the Battle of Badr. The Prophet was comforted by his friend Abu Bakr. He was given hope by his friend Abu Bakr. And so even the most righteous of the righteous, they had friendships. And that experience allowed me to realize that maybe I had been isolating myself so much, thinking it was righteousness, but really I wasn't allowing other people to get to know me. And because of that, I wasn't allowing one of my biggest needs to be met. And that is sisterhood. That is the deep feeling of someone caring about you and calling to see if you're okay after a loved one passes away. Studies have shown that for a stranger to become or an acquaintance to become a friend, it takes 50 hours. For that friendship to deepen, it takes another 40 hours. And for you to become really, really close friends, it takes 200 hours of spending time together. It makes sense. The more that you spend time with someone, the more that you're going to get to know them and the more comfortable that you may feel being able to express your own self to them. Oftentimes when we look at reading the Quran or we look at a sport or we look at a new hobby, we know it's going to take us many hours until we actually reach a place where we feel proficient, where we feel maybe we are not necessarily even an expert, but we know what we're doing. Why are relationships different? Why wouldn't it take work to be able to cultivate that type of relationship that we're seeking in our lives? And as we're navigating this feeling of loneliness in adulthood, especially as we navigate that process, when we are going through being students in college or high school, and then working or becoming a mother or a father or whatever that may look like, or moving to a new city, sometimes it can be really daunting to try to make a new friend. But there are four steps that inshallah we can do ourselves to help create that. The very first one is making dua. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for suhbah salihah. This is a dua that we can make in these last 10 nights of Ramadan for ourselves, for our loved ones. Allahumma o oh Allah, urzuqni, bless me, provide me. This is a rizq. Provide me with suhbah salihah. Bless me with righteous companions. Bless me with good, solid companions. And many people ask, do these companions need to be Muslim? They do not. It is okay, of course, to be friends with those who are not Muslim. Are these people going to bring you closer to Allah? Are these people going to value your religious commitment? Are they going to honor the boundaries and limits that you place? And can you help teach them about the beauty of Islam as well? So learning to cultivate that relationship first begins with making dua and making the intention that inshallah, you can also be a blessing in the lives of the people that are around you. Secondly, steady your heart. There may be times where you make plans. I remember this once time that a, a, a group of friends of mine made a plan to meet. We hadn't met in two or three years. I was so excited. I couldn't wait to meet them. I had planned it. I had asked for help to you know, do certain things. My husband was taking the kids. I couldn't wait to go meet with my friends. An hour before we're supposed to meet up, one of them texted and said she didn't finish folding her laundry, so she couldn't come. Another one texted and said she hadn't taken a shower yet, so she wasn't available. 
Another one said that someone had surprised her out of town. So, okay, that makes sense. I was so hurt that your reasons for not being able to meet after all this time was you haven't folded your laundry, you're taking a shower. I was so hurt that the next time they said they want to meet up, I just refused. I was, I will not engage in this conversation only for my hopes to be dashed again. But you know what happened when I didn't respond? Other people didn't respond either. And that kept happening until finally I asked Allah to help me and I asked for his forgiveness and guidance. And Alhamdulillah, I responded. And I said, I'm committed to coming no matter what. And Alhamdulillah, other people did too. And Alhamdulillah, we recultivated this friendship that we really, really had missed. Thirdly, do an activity, especially with someone new. Maybe it's axe throwing. Maybe it's bowling. Maybe it's going and doing groceries together. Sometimes the effort of working at the same time helps build that bond, especially particular experiences. Maybe you've been camping or maybe you've been to Umrah. Maybe you've had a very deep connection with someone in a moment of pain or hardship, and you have a very particular friendship with that person, even if you don't speak very often. Build that relationship by doing work together. And finally, don't forget, put in the time, 200 hours for you to build a strong relationship. Invest in a relationship. Make the intention that it's worship. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it as worship and help you build that community for yourself and your loved ones. Please welcome poet Amal Kasir. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is a piece written last Ramadan. The devil is shackled, yet the voices are still here. There's still demons in my dungeons. They are whispers in my ears. Let me tell you about these spirits. I thought the monsters to say the least. Fear, loathing, shame, sorrow, living wounds, bearing teeth. They kept my nephew so lonely, so I hid with them for years. Abandoned all community, I thought at best I'd disappear. But I knew I had to free myself, so I set out to find a home. In a world beyond this broken, to sit by God to find his throne. And I took my demons to the mountains, tried to sacrifice them on four peaks. Then one night in lonely question, resurrected, they came to me. They said, Emil, you cannot kill us. You must convert us to your deen. You can't race us. You must face us. You must see what's been unseen. The more you run, the more we grow. We'll grow like pests inside your heart. Begging you to pay attention, you will not heal lest we take part. I could not bear it, all my monsters. They were asking me to know them. Was this some kind of joke? All I've ever known was to woe them. But then I listened closely, and I could hear them speak. I heard them mumbling dua. They said, Ya Allah, don't let us sink. We are gasping, we are gulping, one moment hopeful, then despairing. We want to try to end this life. We feel our soul is up in terror. So like Ishaq, I took their knife. I told them hope is truly daring. Every day is a new life, like the waves all reappearing. All these monsters inside of me, they just needed some attention. Turns out these monsters inside of me also needed Allah's affection. My Lord, you are mercy. All we seek is the light you bring. Help us heal our wounds and demons. Let us make it through to spring. Invite us to the halaqahs with those who know our pain. Show us all your baraka. Send your rahmah down like rain. This world is all collapsing. But my monsters have repented. I was lost, but now I'm found by these feelings God had sent me. My brothers and my sisters, when it seems the end is near, hug the heartache and the monsters. Pray to God, he's as Samir. Stop running from your monsters. Heal them, set them free. Invite them with the butterflies into the garden under this tree. All this burden, 
all this broken, it expands the chest inside. If our hearts were not cracked open, where else would faith reside? So let your knees buckle and let your tears fall. Exhaust the angel on your shoulder so even he can't write it all. My name is Emil and my name means hope. Always keep friendship and community inside of your dua and uh, keep my mother in there too. Hi, Mama, I love you. <laughs> Salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. To transition to a discussion with all of the speakers, inshallah, we have Sheikh Abedullah Evans joining us again and Sheikh Maryam Amir and Sheikh Rami, as you see here, alhamdulillah, and um, Amal, the poet, inshallah, we're going to have some discussions about really everything we talked about here to sum this up because we've been talking about loneliness. We have been talking about how actually to combat this, both in a mental health perspective, in a, an Islamic perspective, in our social perspectives, mashallah. And so I have a couple of questions, hopefully, for the speakers. And we hope this will be a really exciting segment for everybody to really hear everybody discussing this together, inshallah. Shaykh Abedullah, I'm going to start with you, inshallah ta'ala, and ask you a little bit about protective factors towards loneliness and ask you specifically about families. Talk to us, please, about relationships with families and how to really, um, you know, have that get better, inshallah, strengthen those relationships. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wa salatu salam ala rasulihi al-kareem wa ba'd. You know, whenever I think about family, um, a quote always comes to mind. That if you find that you're disillusioned with anything, you should ask yourself, why did I have any illusions about this to begin with? Mm. You know, family is difficult. Family is, is, mm. is, family is a great source of enjoyment. Uh, family is a great source of validation. It's a great source of love, a great source of affection. But family can also be a great source of challenge, a great source of trial, a great source of tribulation. Um, uh, one of my teachers, when I was at Azhar, he said, if you look at the way family is described in the Quran, you find a lot of ch very challenging situations. Mm. I mean, right from the very beginning, there's Cain and Abel, Habil and Qabil. Wow. Um, wow. And then there's Ibrahim and his father. There's Noah and his son. There's Yaqub or Jacob and his sons. There's Yusuf and his brothers, wow. Musa and his stepfather. There's Lut and his wife, Asiya, and her husband. Mm. And my point here is that the test of family and reaching out to family is not because family is supposed to be perfect, right? Relationships are not sustained through perfection, but rather forgiveness. So I think, you know, the Prophet ﷺ, he gave us a direct order when he said, Seel al arham you know, reach out to your relatives, right? Be in relationship with your relatives. And it's not contingent upon their being unproblematic or they're being perfect or they're being easy or they're being enjoyable. It's just them belonging to us. Now, of course, if there is something huge, like there's been some abuse or something like that, you know, we're not talking, we're talking about, you know, the, the, the small, sometimes trivial, um, you know, issues that keep mm -hmm. us separate mm -hmm. from our, uh, families, we really have to find a way of transcending those, getting past those. And I'll say one last thing and, and maybe move from this question to someone that can offer a more enlightening response. As you get older, and I learned this from uh, Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah, you know, he said to me, you know, as you get older, you will inevitably notice people's weaknesses. You will notice mm -hmm. their shortcomings. You will notice their flaws, especially people close to you. If God blesses you, you will see those shortcomings, you will see those flaws, you will see those weaknesses through a prism of mercy. Wow. So when you think about your relatives, you think about your uncle, you think about your aunts, you think about mom, you think about dad, you think about your siblings, don't judge them. Think about the burdens that they carry and then marvel at the fact that they carry them as they do and forgive them. And know that you too are in need of forgiveness. I have not been perfect as a nephew. I haven't been perfect as an uncle. I haven't been perfect as a brother. I haven't been perfect as a husband or a son. Yeah. Yeah. And so why would my expectation of anyone else be perfection? 
right? So reach out to your relatives and embrace them in the fullness of their humanity, even if that means you get an opportunity to practice the sunnah of forgiving them. Mm. Mashallah. Mm. And Allah knows best. That's beautiful. Mashallah. Sheikh Ubaidullah, I just want to thank you so much for mentioning, you know, the nuances of relationships, because sometimes when we talk about Islam and, you know, building relationships and maintaining those connections, we don't recognize those, you know, circumstances where someone is experiencing abuse or some something else that's much greater than the little trivial things that keep, keep people apart. And that narrative pushes so many people into difficult situations or even toxic relationships thinking Islam wants me to do this and can bring greater harm to themselves or their family. So may Allah bless you for re bringing nuance to this and bless Maristan for the healing work that they do for families and helping them process the trauma that comes with it. Sheikh Rami, I wonder if you had a thought on this. I know you've done a lot of work on, um, you know, you've been translating a book called Birr al-Walidayn or Righteousness to Parents. And I wonder how you you know, you've, you've counseled a lot of people on a topic like this over the years. Yeah, um, and, and thank you, Sheikh Abdullah. I've, I've benefited immensely. I mean, some of the insight that you that you shared, especially about the families in the Quran, never mm -hmm. you never heard about it before. So may Allah bless you and bless your Sheikh who sh who shared that with you, and may Allah bless his family and your family. Uh, this is the month of the Quran, and I always love trying to get more understanding of the Quran. And and what I experience in Mauritania is that the whole mahdara turns to the Quran, recitation, tafsir, understanding, and uh, learning more about it. So may Allah bless you Allah, and bless your teacher. Um, while I was in Mauritania during Ramadan, one of the things that one of my teachers encouraged me to do was study the books of Sheikh Muhammad Maudud, which it's a series of books that really focus on the, the lesser known lessons of the sunnah that he saw were pervasive in the society that people were not studying. So they would study more, they would study grammar, they would study logic, they would study uh, fiqh, they would study all these sciences, but they're not studying the purification of the heart or mm. the prohibitions of the tongue or the rights of parents. Mm. And so he wrote these short books and they were really impactful to me and helped me during my Ramadan um, uh, journey of, of, uh, of purification. Uh, that we go through. When I started studying the Birr al-Walidain book, I said, wow, I need to translate this. I want to uh, I want to teach this to people. And, I, and when I came back, it was uh, the year 2000, right after Y2K. I, I did a quick translation. I did some lessons. It had amazing impact. People, after I taught that very short lesson, and maybe a two, two and a half hour seminar, one person came up to me and he said, and he had just walked through the, um, the, 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 the musalla area where I was teaching and he was going to leave, but he started listening. Something caught his ear and he leaned up against the door and I thought he was just going to leave after 10 or 15 minutes. He leaned there for two hours and he listened to everything. He came up to me afterwards and he said, um, he said, he said, you know, thank you for that lesson. I haven't spoken to my father in 16 years and I didn't know what to say. And he said, I didn't actually, I didn't know what to respond. And he said, I think it's time I give him a call. Mm -hmm. And that was from that work of Sheikh Muhammad Mawlud. So I, that just kept, and I kept hearing stories like that over and over. People not talking to their parents, living in the same house for six months, they wouldn't speak to their parents. And that book changed them. So I translated, I put it a commentary, I taught it online, I, I, I taught so many people. The one consistent question that I have gotten at the end of that book, when they're presented with all of our tradition about respect of parents and honor of parents and the, the Quran and the stories, the tafsir and uh, the hadith, the one question that I get is, what about if my parents abused me? What if my parents were toxic? What if my parents were narcissists? What if my parents, I just, I, I, you know, and one man came up to me at Isna and thanked me for the course, but then he stood there and start, tears rolling down his eyes. He said, I can't be around my dad. And so there's deep trauma, there's deep hurt. Sheikh Abdullah mentioned this, alluded to, he said, you know, uh, about, he said, we're talking about the, you know, uh, the general, you know, family issues that are more light, but sometimes there can be deep trauma. And so what I what I encourage everyone to learn is, yes, we learn the rights of, of, of parents and we learn what's the optimum. But then we realize, what if I need to learn healthy boundaries in how to deal with them? What if I need to be able to heal from my trauma? That's where work like Maristan really comes into play, where you have clinicians who are working as 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 as. Uh, on the same team with people who have that religious expertise and they can they can help this person navigate this very, very difficult uh, terrain of how do I respect my parents and protect my own mental health well-being? How do I how do I heal from the trauma while at the same time 
fulfilling the rights of parents. And I'll end on this. Um, Sister Sinead O'Connor, um, uh, she became Muslim a few years ago. And you can see, you know, she was very vocal about her Islam. May Allah protect her and bless her and bless her family. And she just went through a very uh, a tragedy of losing her son um, by suicide. And um, may Allah ease the, her, her pain. She became Muslim. She took the name Shuhada over the martyrs of, of, uh, of Ireland that she saw as, as martyrs um, in, that, in that struggle for, for independence. And my mom's side of the family is Irish, so that I have that, that connection. And I was really happy when she became Muslim, just for herself, but also for my people. Um, and, um, and so she has a video on Dr. Phil where she talks about her trauma with her mother, who was extremely, extremely abusive. But she talked about how she eventually be, came to terms with that. I encourage you to watch that video because it really juxtaposes both of that thing, the deep hurt, well, along with noticing that connection that Allah has given to us through that. Thank you so much, Sheikh Rami. And it's, mm -hmm. these are difficult topics. And, I'm, and I want to say here, just pause for a second for everyone listening. You know, the work that we do at Madistan, which is meant to be a, you know, therapeutic, holistic, healing sessions and therapy. We're raising funds literally for people to be able to seek out support for the small things and the large things, for the everyday things and the very traumatic things that happen in our lives, subhanAllah. And all of these, as we know as Muslims, are tests from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he calls on us to seek out cures and help. And that's really important. It's part of our Islamic duty to actually seek out that kind of help. And this is what we're offering today, inshallah. And I just want to say this very quickly. I want to go to Sheikh Maryam Nas to ask her a question. But I want to tell you all, because people will ask, can we seek out therapy at Madistan? Yes, it is open. It is ready. If you are in the state of California, please do reach out. Info at maristan.org if you need to have any sessions. If any of this conversation here is triggering you in any way or reminding you that this is something you'd like to actually reach out for help for. And if you are not in the state of California, if you go to our website on the resources tab, and we'll put all this in the chat, there are directories of all these different Muslim mental health clinicians across the country and even globally that you can put in where you are located and hopefully find someone near you. Now, Sheikh Maryam, you talked to us so beautifully, mashallah, in the lecture about, you know, um, friendship. And as another form of really helping and healing our isolation and our loneliness. And you talked so beautifully about, um, you know, how to really deepen that. And I wonder if we can hear from you a little bit more about deepening that, particularly as adults. Especially as adults, it can be difficult for us to navigate meeting new people and being vulnerable with individuals. And... I think one of the ways that we can actually help our own selves in building these relationships is by lightheartedly having these conversations where we can ask questions that help other people realize that we want to get to know them beyond how's the weather and how's Ramadan mm -hmm. going in a very yeah. general way. Uh, researchers talk about working and building relationships through asking specific types of questions. So for example, getting together when you're going out to eat and instead of saying, um, you know, let's say it's someone recent, an acquaintance you've recently met, instead of asking something like, oh, you know, how are the kids, which is an important question, of course, but something like, tell me about your most embarrassing moment or share with me um, the last time you, you cried. Or tell me about a hope that you have for your future. And these questions might seem very intense for someone that you just met. But at the same time, it also points to someone wanting to get to know you beyond a very surface level interaction. And it can also help if you're willing to share first. And of course, you should make sure that the person you're talking to wants to actually inter inter interact in this engagement. But you can begin by saying, you know, let me tell you the answer to that for me and then ask them. And also being able to hype one another up is sometimes really important. Sometimes even when it's a, a recent friend, a recent acquaintance, that hype up helps you to feel like you can feel comfortable around this person in a way that allows you to also accept their advice when they're ready to share it. So I'll end by sharing this story. I was recently talking to a new friend that I feel so grateful to have. I remember when I first met her, um, like a few months ago, we were literally like, are we, are we actually friends? Are we, 
did we make a friendship? We were so excited about it, even though we've only spoken a few times. And um, she was telling me about how this Ramadan, she just feels like she hasn't been able to focus in her worship. And I was like, I know I've had the same problem. And she's like, yeah, you know, my mind is with the kids and with this and with that and my health. And, and so she's talking about all these things. And I'm like, oh, you got to take care of your health. No, no, no. You're taking care of your kids. And then I'm telling her my things. And she's like, no, no, but you're doing this and you're doing this. And we're just, yeah, no, we're, we're trying so hard in Ramadan. And in the end, we both looked at each other and we're like, we need to try harder. But the point was in the beginning, it was like, no, we, we're we here for you. We're here. We got this. And then, oh, no, we're, we're going to support each other and trying even harder. And sometimes getting to that outcome takes some time of building each other up to be able to know we're safe for one another. And we're not going to let each other do this alone. We're going to get to a point where we can support one another through this, even if it's just asking, are you hitting your goal? How's it going? And even just knowing I'm not alone. My Ramadan hasn't been as good as I wanted it to be. And neither has hers. And that doesn't make either of us terrible believers. It means we're struggling and that we're not done and that we can keep going, inshallah, and try to achieve our goals, inshallah, and even more. SubhanAllah. I, I would love to just echo off of that, Sheikh Maryam, and, and just like that conversation you had with your friend, just, it was like, are we friends? Is this actually happening? And how necessary it has been in, in my personal journey too, to like have that conversation. Like, yo, I, it, this is a struggle. Uh, I want a friendship. What, what do you want out of a friendship? What do I want out of a friendship? And there's, there's this vulnerability there and, and always with vulnerability, it requires courage, but, um, and, and, and over time, the trust building and putting the marbles in the jars, as Brene Brown talks about in that, in that process. And I, I had this realization with a new friend of mine as well, who I made during Ramadan. She really feels like, a, like an answer to some dua. But we, we were talking about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and, and, and our orphan prophet. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala make us like him, Ya Rab, and how... Mm -hmm. He did not have his siblings. He did not have his family. He had his friends. He had his sahaba. And that there's so much richness in these beautiful relationships that we have. And to add this more deliberate intentionality of what mm -hmm. do we want together in this friendship, I have found so many more fulfilling relationships through this instead of just kind of like being like awkward, like eighth wheel or ninth wheel, I guess, mm -hmm. for using the semi-truck metaphor, um, not really knowing how to fit and, and how to squeeze into these conversations. Um, it's so valuable to have these meaningful conversations with, with our friends and try to embody this community of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahu alayhi wa sallam, mashallah. So beautiful. And I really hope everyone's this I know it's I know it's resonating with me. I hope it's resonating with everybody here. Mm -hmm. I want to say in kind of wrapping up this section of our discussion, and I we could talk this group, mashallah, I could talk to you all forever. <laughs> That's <laughs> Literally, alhamdulillah. I want to mention that there's a couple of questions that came through the chat, and I appreciate that very much. And there's one in particular I wonder if you know if our scholars here can speak to a little bit, inshallah. You know, we talked a little bit about Part of this healing process is on how to set what I'll interpret it as healthy boundaries, right? And people hear that word boundaries um, mm -hmm. and they think this is kind of a Western thing. It doesn't belong to us Muslims, but in reality, you know, it actually is in fact part of our tradition. And so I want inshallah for us to talk just a little bit about that because this question comes up about boundaries and particularly the questions asking about when people meddle in your life and they act like the judge, jury and executioner and end up causing more kind of fitna or difficulty. And so I wonder if each of us can actually just say something kind of to this point and you know Sheikh Abedullah can you start us off inshallah uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim you know whenever I hear about uh, boundaries I never I never deem it kind of a, a western intrusion into our mm -hmm. uh, Islamic tradition mm -hmm. I think about trying to do good in a sustainable way it's it's, it's trying to say, you know khairul uh, umuri indallahi adwamuha wa in qalla that the best deeds in the sight of God are those that are performed with the most consistency, even if they're small. So if I know that, you know, there's a certain level of interaction with an individual that will probably descend into toxicity, mm. it will probably descend into uh, something unwanted, something undesirable, then setting that boundary is not because I want to keep them at arm's length, but I want to maintain the goodness, the sweetness in the relationship. You know, we need to have boundaries so that we don't go into areas that we don't, we don't need to be. Mm. So whenever I think about boundaries, I just think about it like, 
you know, if I engage someone and we, uh, you know, cross a boundary, that engagement will become regrettable to me. That engagement will become lamentable to me. And then over time, I will probably end up avoiding that person or not wanting to be in the company of that person. But if we set healthy boundaries, we can sustain our relationship and we can grow it. You know, so I think about, you know, setting boundaries like planting, uh, uh, you know, seeds that, you know, I have a, a regimen according to which I water them and give mm -hmm. them sunlight and give them plant food so that they can grow and eventually fructify. You know, so it's not it's not like boundaries. Oh, I don't you know, I'm I'm Xing you out of my life. No, I'm trying to determine how we can deal with each other on the basis of sustained goodness. And when the, the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, you don't, you, don't, you don't learn that he grew tired of anyone's company, nor did anyone grow tired of his company, mm -hmm. right? Because they had very good boundaries. And when a boundary was crossed, right? I, I'm thinking about the Walima of the Prophet Alaihi mm Wasallam -hmm. when he married Safiya. Um, uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down revelation. After you eat, get out. <laughs> you know, after you eat, leave. Because the Prophet ﷺ had such hishma, such ihtisham that he wouldn't he wouldn't tell them like you're kind of crossing a line and overstaying your welcome. So God told them, don't overstay your welcome. This to me is a is a great example, a Quranic example of setting a boundary mm -hmm. so that we can have a relationship of sustained goodness. Mm -hmm. And Allah knows best. I'm wondering if the other folks would like to just kind of give us another couple lines here on this topic, inshallah, as we close this section out. Yeah, I'd like uh, you know, Sheikh Abdullah, when you when you were speaking about how when you when you heard about boundaries, it didn't you know it didn't make you feel like this is a Western tradition, and and that's a really important point because. There's still a lot of people who, when they hear the term mental health or mental health illness or education, they're like, oh, this is from outside of our tradition. And what I found, even though I'm not a mental health professional, although I'm married to one, and I, I sometimes joke that I, I should start a group, you know, a support group for those who are married to mental health professionals, because we get plenty <laughs> of free advice. But um, and uh, <laughs> um, but I've just done a lot of reading, you know, on, on various topics, you know, and um, and and some training that, that that I've used in my coaching and my work with 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 prisoners and life coaching and you know and helping them get through things. Um, but I've noticed so many similarities. You know, so when we when we see terms in some of these traditions, we can say, oh, that's that's this, you know, in, in our tradition or that's this. So when they talk about boundaries, we have an understanding. Hudud. Allah talks about the hudud of Allah. He talks about the hima, the sacred precinct of, of Allah and don't come close to it. And, and we also know that every believer has it has it has a hima around them and has a sanctity, just like the mm -hmm. just like Mecca and Medina and Quds mm -hmm. all have sanctuaries. The believer has a sanctuary. And, and it has to be protected. And so we have to build that up on the spiritual side and then on the mental health side with people recognizing that to say, okay, how do I how do I build that up? And then, like you said, that it doesn't mean that we cut people off. We still have to engage in people, but we know who we're going to keep close. And we're going to have like uh, uh, Sheikh Maryam was saying, you know, you're my friend. I'm your friend. You know, you know who that's going to be. And you know who the person that you're just going to say at the Eid prayer, Assalamu alaikum, you know, from far away, but kind of like, yeah, let's just, just stay on that side next to the bouncy houses. I'm going to go over here and get some slushies or something. Uh, we know how to do that. And then during those times where we need to speak, you know, that's what, like, you you mentioned the Quran and and how Allah, you know, sent revelation. He's teaching his prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa how to establish boundaries and healthy boundaries or how to speak in front of him when they raise their voices in front of him or when people would say things to the prophet. He was he was not antagonistic towards people in what he said, but he was direct, uh, in addition to, like you said, he he had that 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 modesty that prevented him. So sometimes we need other people to help us draw those boundaries, and that's where the the, the beauty of the Maristan is, and what Maristan or uh, um, uh, is doing is that it's bringing that those two traditions. You know, looking at what the modern mental health uh, tradition has done, because the Muslims were never, um, uh, you know, um, shy about taking from other traditions and seeing what what meshes with our tradition. Mm -hmm. MashaAllah. I, I can't thank you enough for saying that. And that really is what's inspiring us. As we said earlier, when people ask, what does Maristan even mean? We explain that it's the traditional healing centers of the Muslims, Bimar, 
is the ill person and Stan is the place of and be Stan where these holistic healing treatment centers, the first in human history to have mental health or psychiatric wards. The Muslims were the first at this. Like you said, we weren't shy from learning and then adding upon. And I just want to say folks are benefiting from this. So they feel like, whoa, this is amazing to learn about boundaries and how Islamically to put this together. If this is helpful to you, I want to tell you that Madistan every single month has healing circles and educational circles on mental health, Islamic psychology, and Islam that are free and that are open to everyone. You don't have to be in therapy to benefit from those. There's the clinic that we're hoping to launch with actual professional mental health therapy and care. But then there's also these healing sessions that are monthly and free and open to everybody. And I hope that topics like this, because this is exactly the kind of thing we address there, that you come and actually join us. وصلى اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم وصلى اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم يا رب العالمين we come before you, you know, in these blessed last 10 days of Ramadan beseeching you for your mercy يا رب العالمين يا رب العالمين we know that we might be the least deserving of your mercy but we are the most in need of it يا رب العالمين Ya Rabbul Alameen, your name is Al-Afu. You are the pardoner. And you love Afu. You love to pardon. Wa'afu anna, Ya Rabbul Alameen. Ya Rabbul Alameen, if there's any member of our assembly this afternoon that is dealing with sadness or depression or loneliness, we ask that you give them suhba saliha, that you give them good company. And you allow them to taste felicity in your remembrance, Ya Rabbul Alameen. Ya Rabbul Alameen, we ask that you support this effort, that you support this initiative with special aid from yourself. Because these are people that are trying to restore Islam to a place of dignity and prominence in the modern world, Ya Rabbul Alameen. Making our community a place of light, a place of love, a place of relief, a place of support for people who need it, Ya Rabbul Alameen. Ya Rabbul Alameen, I pray that you reward Dr. Rania and the entire team at Maristan uh, for such a, a beautiful project that is done seeking your face and your face exclusively, Ya Rabbul Alameen. Ya Rabbul Alameen, we ask you for the choicest blessings in these last 10 days of Ramadan and that you grant this effort barakah and that you grant this effort baraka, that you grant this effort baraka, so that it will exceed even the wildest hopes and dreams of its creators and all of its beneficiaries, Ya Rabbul Alameen. Wa akhru da'awana and alhamdulillah Rabbul Alameen. Wa sallallahu ma'ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Ameen Ya Rabbul Alameen.